Hey, kid. Want to buy some video games? Yeah, of course I got Mario. I got Mario right here. Look at this. Good quality Mario. Top shelf Mario. Look, kids, this is the real deal. Genuine article Nintendo seal of approval. What? You think Mario was always the proof of the curated icon of gaming he is now? No, Nintendo was not as careful with the Mario IP in the early days. Man, are you gonna make me do a whole video about this? Okay, you know what? Fine, let's do a whole video. Sit down and buckle up for the world of weird Mario games. Mario, an unchanging eternal icon. You can always rely on a Mario game for a streamlined, fun, Nintendo-approved experience, right? Wrong! Were you watching the intro to this? That's, that's the point of this video! Yeah, okay, nowadays Mario is a video game icon. Sleek and smooth, designed for maximum appeal and potential earnings for Big Daddy Nintendo. A Mario product is reliably high quality and guaranteed to be fun. Nintendo is as careful with their star IP as Disney, well, as Disney used to be with their many properties. But in the past, Nintendo was honestly kind of sloppy. Yeah, nowadays Mario is a very meticulously managed property to the point where I'm honestly still kind of surprised the Mario movie exists at all. Especially considering how the first try without went, but we'll, we'll touch on that later. But there have been some bizarre Mario games before Nintendo really nailed down what it meant to be Mario. So for this video, we're going to take a look at some of the notably stranger games Mario has appeared in and the weirder elements of the games you are familiar with. I've arbitrarily decided to only play mostly the mainline Mario games with Mario in the title because there is a lot of stuff out there and as long as this video is, it's really just kind of scratching the surface. So basically this video is an extremely brief history of the weirdest Mario games, but it is by no means an exhaustive list because holy moly, I think I'm going to have to make a follow-up video with all the stuff I found. Anyway, for your convenience, we're going to tackle this mostly chronologically. Stay tuned, I'm your host the Doom Prophet and this is... Donkey Kong 1981. Guess what? Mario's first ever appearance is actually kind of weird. Why? Well, he's not exactly his normal hands himself. The concept is there, but it's, uh, it's rough. And although he is a playable character in this 1981 arcade cabinet game. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right, Zoomers. You used to have to go somewhere to play games because home computing and or gaming devices were barely a thing. I know that's kind of wild to think about since you're watching this on one of your 10 devices that can play YouTube and you haven't held a quarter in your hand in years, which is in fact what these things ran on, converting the nickel copper mix into the energy required to power the screen. <laughs> I almost got you. You did have to pay though. Microtransactions are literally rooted in the origins of gaming. <clears throat> Anyway, even though he's a playable character, his name isn't mentioned here. This is Donkey Kong's game, and technically this is a two-for-one origin story, Donkey Kong and Mario right here. Also, you probably all know this because you've seen it a million times by now, but technically his name here is Jumpman. He won't be renamed Mario until the sequel to this arcade cabinet called Donkey Kong Jr. He plays Donkey Kong Jr., and Mario is actually the villain. But we're skipping over that particular arcade cabinet because this video is getting crowded as is. But stick around because it'll be good, and also I need the watch time for the YouTube overlords. So obviously at this point, I can't really criticize how Nintendo is managing Mario as a brand because this is the very first game Mario appears in and the concept of mascot characters representing brands. Well, if I were to get into that, it would be an insanely long history heavy video, so let's not do that. But we are moving on to... So, what is a Game & Watch? Well, it's sort of like a single serving video game. Like imagine if instead of systems that you buy games for, you just bought games and every game was a system. So back in the early 80s, Nintendo sold a couple of these, which were not only a game, but also told time. Hence, game and watch. What a handy little gadget. I gotta get me one of the... What? Nintendo sold 43.6 million of these? The 80s must have been rough in terms of entertainment. <laughs> Looking at these, I think I would actually rather play outside. Anyway, as quaint as this concept may seem to us now, the Mario Game & Watch is were extremely successful and the sheer amount of units moved was fundamental to the success of Mario. Quick rundown on how these machines work, they're not pixel based but instead have entire sprites pre-configured into every possible combination the game might need, and they just light up whenever appropriate. You might be old enough to remember things like the Tiger Electronic Games, which are basically a continuation of the legacy of the Game & Watch, until, well, it's hard to say what put these in the grave, maybe cell phones becoming common? Thank you. 
So as far as I can tell, this is the first game to have the Mario Bros. title. And this one folds up like a little game book with buttons to control the brothers on each side. And it's technically multiplayer with one player per brother. Oh yeah, and I think this is Luigi's first appearance as well. Look, the gameplay is basically the life of a wagey. You work at an Amazon warehouse and pass meaningless packages back and forth between the brothers, eventually filling a delivery truck. If you mess up or take a break, Mario's boss yells at him. Gameplay is not exactly thrilling, and my ADHD Zoomer brain already demands we move on. Two, Mario bombs away. Oh my god, is that Vietnam War Mario? Is that Heart of Darkness Mario? I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Is that ha 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 ain't war hell Mario? What were they thinking? So in this game, Mario has to pass a bomb from one side of the screen to the other without the fuse being lit by enemy VC er, soldiers up top or his allies negligence on the bottom. This game has three buttons, move left, right, or a single button that toggles Mario's hands up and down. Anyway, I don't really know what more to say about this abomination, so I'm moving on to... Wait, what? Nintendo sends cease and desist letters right and left, but they straight up rip off another one bites the dust by Queen? Talk about hypocritical. Well, at least this one has quite a bit less existential dread, instead featuring Mario in a world where OSHA doesn't exist. He has to juggle what must be at least a four-man cement factory job while not getting crushed to death. Truly, a thankless job. Hey, wait, I think I've seen his crusher somewhere. Okay, look, I know Game & Watch games aren't the most exciting thing, but we have to talk about them in order to put the truly weird stuff in context. Finally, we have Donkey Kong 2. Is that an original chunky Nintendo DS? This is probably the best one of the ones I've played, and as mentioned earlier, Mario is the villain and has locked up DK, and it's up to us playing as DK Jr. to rescue him. It feels the most like an actual game you might play today, and you have to make it from the bottom screen all the way to the top. But, in my heart of hearts, I definitely believe this is the prototype of the DS. But it's not really weird enough, so let's not linger. We've made it to the first non-Mario concept that Mario is blatantly shoved into, and it's, uh, it's pinball. R -R -R. R -R -R. Except there's no fun music and it just seems really bland. And maybe they knew that because you can activate this little Mario minigame where you control Mario and try to rescue Pauline as she falls. And honestly, this little minigame is the best part of this pinball game. So the only part of pinball that isn't pinball is the best part of pinball. Moving on. This is it. This is the year that Nintendo figures out what Mario will be. This is the goose that lays the golden egg. This game will echo into the future up until the very minute you're watching this video. Super Mario Bros. This game was so good, it uncrashed the video game market, which had crashed two years prior. This was the best-selling game of all time for quite a while until Nintendo did it again with Wii Sports. Although both have since been dethroned. So, what's so important about this game? All right, are you ready? The screen moves? Yeah, I bet you didn't even think about that, but up until now, Mario games have been stuck on one screen. This is a whole new world of gaming, and it has everything that Mario is going to be in the future. You're in the Mushroom Kingdom, rescuing a princess from King Koopa. You have a mini form and a big form. You eat mushrooms to get bigger. One pill makes you larger. You can power up with Fire Flower. There's pipes that go underground. There's Goombas, Koopas, the Kitus. This sets the foundation for what is normal, and in that sense, whatever deviates from this formula is going to be weird. And that's why we're talking about it, because this is now the golden standard. All right, honorable mention time. I am a teacher, Super Mario Sweater. Now, this is a bit of a technicality, but it was released on the Famicom Disk System, so it's technically a game? And if you didn't know, the Famicom was the Japanese version of the NES, and had an addition called the Disk System that, well, played discs, that were apparently way cheaper than cartridges and were also rewritable. And you could take those discs to Nintendo kiosks and be like, new game please, and they would do that for you. Anyway, I'm a Teacher is more of a piece of software than a game, but it helps you design sweater patterns with your favorite Mario characters on it. 
All right, let's try to do a pattern. Um, I guess we're gonna we're gonna go with number one. This is it's a good place to start. Um, uh, yeah, these these numbers look good, I guess. <laughs> look, the little sheep is giving us like a tarot card reading or something. What's he up to down there? Okay, for some reason we're choosing the piece of clothing after the measurements, or at least that's what I thought the previous page was. Let's go with this. This looks nice for the summer. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is either the worst maze of all time, or I don't know how sewing works at all. Alright, let's give this another shot. I want to see some Mario, so we're going to randomly choose... Uh, let's choose one of the later ones. Mm-hmm, looks good. Okay, we'll do a little side vest. Alright, I think I recognize those toes. Okay, so it looks like every time I press A, it flips the pattern from left to right? Which I think is actually flipping it upside down. I don't know anything about sewing, but if I spend enough time with this game, I may be able to reverse engineer and learn how to sew. I don't know exactly how this helps. Like, do you print it out afterwards or something? But I'm very tempted to hunt down one of these so I can get that Mario drip. Okay, so remember how the game right before this establishes what Mario will be? Well, this game just takes all that and throws it out the window. Jumping on enemies doesn't kill them. You're in this weird storybook world. You can choose from four different characters, Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Peach. And overall, the game just has a different vibe. So why is that? Well, this is a fake Mario game. After the 1985 Super Mario Bros, Nintendo released a follow-up called The Lost Levels, which is a harder remix version that's considered a soft sequel. But Nintendo's opinions of Americans is so low, they were like, nah. That's too hard for them. We don't want our company image associated with frustration. And then they reskinned another game for the Famicom called Doki Doki Panic to get a makeshift Mario game. Ironically, this reskin of some random game would end up establishing characteristics of some of the cast that would stick. Like Luigi's taller and jumps better and does that little leg kick thing, or Peach can float with magic or something. There are also enemies introduced here like Shy Guy and Birdo that are still around in Mario lore. Anyway, although this is sort of an imposter game, it definitely counts in the weird Mario lineage. And funnily enough, this Mario reskin got released in Japan years later as Super Mario USA. Even though Japan had already basically played the game with the original Doki Doki Panic, Nintendo truly milking this one. But they'll never milk a game again like that, right? R right? All right, another honorable mention. This game is Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan and 3 in the West, but that's not why it's weird. Although this is basically a direct successor to Super Mario Bros, both in terms of gameplay and in spirit, this game does something a little funky with the stages. It looks like they're all constructed instead of naturally occurring, leading to a theory that the events of Super Mario Bros 3 are stage play, with all of the characters performing something rather than the actual events transpiring. This was confirmed as true decades later in 2015 by Miyamoto himself. This sort of deep lore in Mario is interesting, and I'm not sure Nintendo ever really played with this notion again. Maybe help me out in the comments if you know anything. Also, this game introduces a bunch of weird power-ups in the form of suits. We got frog suit, hammer suit, raccoon suit, boot suit. All in all, there are some strange elements of this game, but it's mostly just Mario 2 more Mario. Super Mario Land. We finally made it to the Game Boy era. So this game was released on Nintendo's brand new portable gaming device, the legendary Grey Brick itself. And with every new device Nintendo would make, so too comes a new Mario. To differentiate these Mario games from the ones on other systems, Nintendo makes up the convention that Game Boy games have land in the title. Anyway, I have a lot to say about this game, mostly bad. Look, I'm gonna level with you, this game kinda sucks. You can blame hardware or whatever, but god damn. Look at him, Mario's ugly. I know it's black and white, but something more about that is just off. Especially his mini form. Randy, I don't know how to express my feelings about this. Can you take it away? So people got no reason to live. Okay, m maybe you went a little too hard, Randy. You can't go left anymore. Every title after Mario 1985 lets you go left, so this is taking a big step backwards in the sense that you actually can't step backwards and can only step forward. The Mario, whack. Enemies, whack. Music, whack. Especially the star theme. It's just the can-can? But why would they do this? They already had a specific song for this well-established in several games now. The bosses all make this really annoying noise when you hurt them. And let's talk locations. They feel so random and unmario like There's Egypt? I, I don't know what this is. China? Huh? Yeah, I understand. Okay, I'm cancelled. Well, it was a good run, boys. 
This entire game just feels like a weird dollar store ripoff Mario, but it's a real game. And the last boss is an airship battle, which should be cool, but it's just... Blech. Also, I did look up that particular enemy, and I think it's actually a Jiangxi, a sort of hopping zombie vampire, traditional folklore creature from China. So if you could uh, uncancel me, that would be great. Don't want no stone people around here. Okay, moving on to the 90s. It's the 90s now, so I'm gonna do a three frame anime girl dance. This is the era where Nintendo got really wild with it and just started trying random stuff, even licensing Mario out to other companies, which seems unbelievable now. So our first weird Mario property of the 90s is... Oh, you thought I wasn't gonna include this? No, this game is super weird. You've just been conditioned to think of it as normal because of Super Smash Bros. The plot, so to speak, of this game is that Mario is the main epidemiologist doing work at the Mushroom Kingdom Hospital. And it's a puzzle game where you match colors. Look, if I'm being completely cynical, I have to imagine they had a somewhat generic puzzle game on their hands, and they decided to slap Mario's face on it to sell more units. Because, be honest with yourself, do you really think they designed a game from the ground up with the intention of having Mario be a doctor? No way. I choose to believe he was shoehorned in at the last minute, and he can't change my mind. Nevertheless, this is definitely a weird Mario game, and I don't want to hear another thing about it. Here it is, considered by many to be the holy grail of weird Mario games, Mario Teaches Typing for MS-DOS, which was basically Windows before Windows was Windows. This is pretty much exactly what it says it is. You make a little profile and it supposedly teaches you typing. Except it's uh, not really that great at that. It shows you which finger is supposed to hit which key, but it's not exactly thorough. The way the game works is you have different stages that ramp up in difficulty. The first is crushing enemies and smashing blocks by typing single keys. The second stage is typing entire words while swimming away from a cheap cheap, and the third is navigating a castle while typing entire sentences. The weird thing is there's no way to really fail. All the stages are just time-based. The first one is the only one that's actually interactive, where your character will take an action for every key you type. The other stages are really just a Mario screensaver to sort of watch while you learn typing? I don't know, I think I'd rather play Type Racer any day. I guess it's cool that you can play as Mario, Luigi, or Peach, but honestly, the worst part of it all is that when you get to typing whole sentences, you realize the game is doubly educational. You're learning typing by typing American history. This would be a huge ripoff if I was a kid expecting this to be any fun at all. People often say this game is weird, but it's not that weird. It's bizarre conceptually, sure, but it's just about as bland as you could possibly make a typing game. The only thing that does stand out is Mario's bizarre voiceover, which is oddly aggressive. Congratulations, you made it! Maybe it's just weird because it's not Charles Martinet's voice, but rather someone named Ronald B. Rubin, so it sounds extra strange. I don't know. Super Mario Bros. and Friends When I Grow Up. This is another MS-DOS oddball. I guess it could be called educational, but it's sort of just a digital coloring book. There's quite a variety of scenes where Mario has all kinds of occupations, and you see some other Nintendo friends as well. For some of the scenes, you can hit the button to do a brief little animation accompanied by some awful music. For me, this is sort of peak weird Mario because there's no real reason to do this. I'm serious, there is no reason for this to exist, period. I feel no matter what characters may be inserted into a digital coloring book game for MS-DOS, it's just not going to move that many units. People want to play actual games, so what's the point of this? It's this kind of mysterious enigma where an entire piece of software seems to have been produced on a whim. What if Mario was a coloring book? What, was there a physical coloring book first that Nintendo converted? We just don't know. Now this is the real deal. The creme de la creme of weird Mario. Whoever thought of making a Mario themed version of MS Paint? And furthermore, whoever thought it would actually be really good? Especially considering the last entry we looked at, which is extremely lazy by comparison. But wait. I know what you're thinking. How can you use a graphics design program without a mouse? Enter the Super Nintendo mouse. Yeah, now Nintendo is no stranger to bizarre peripherals, but this one honestly kind of makes sense. Anyway, all this really had to be was a little piece of software you can do doodles with a few Mario themed stamps, but they went so much harder. Even the title screen has more effort put into it than entire games on this list. Like I would rather play the Mario Paint title screen than pinball. 
You have an insane amount of tools. You have all kinds of colors and textures to work with. You've got classic Mario stuff to lay down. You can make your own custom stamps to use. And it's even got a music making mode where you can make your own custom Mario tunes. And the music slaps. The whole game has this cheeky sense of humor with how it's presented, and I definitely feel like the people who worked on this must have had a hand in the later series WarioWare, because they just kind of vibe that same way. Look at this amazing mini game where you swat some flies. Everything about this game goes hard, and it's weird. But as strange as this is, it's not even scratching the surface. Nintendo would later release a whole suite of art tools as a sequel to Mario Paint on the Nintendo 64 Double D dynamic drive, which you probably didn't even know existed because it was only in Japan. And that stuff, ugh, well, I don't have the time to get to it in this video, but if you want to make another video, leave a comment down below. All right, back on the Game Boy and back to a normal platforming Mario game, right? First of all, remember the last Game Boy game? It blows my mind that these are on the same system. I feel like in the modern era, we would never get a jump like this on the same console, but whatever. I guess they figured out the Game Boy, their own system that they made. So this game seems pretty normal at first, but it actually has what I think are some pretty interesting deviations from the formula thrown in. This game was actually the inspiration to make this video. I was going back to play it because I never did, and I was struck by how Mario it felt, but how un-Mario at the same time. If, uh, if that makes any sense at all. Look, so the places Mario visits have sort of been established as nice grasslands, maybe some water levels, some cloud levels, perhaps even a spooky boo house level. And maybe it's because I've played so many Mario games, but now those locations seem a bit recycled and maybe even generic to me. I mean, they're absolutely classic, but they're not exactly surprising you. When a new Mario game comes out, you kind of know where you're going. You're gonna like it, yeah, but you already know. However, this game shakes it up. We got levels inside a sunken submarine, inside a whale. We got macro world where Mario is tiny. Tree world where you fight a bunch of insects. Pumpkin world, which is like a weird discount Halloween town. An early visit to Super Mario Galaxy. And perhaps the most bizarre, an entire world that takes place inside an enormous animatronic Mario. Do not look at mechanical Mario directly in the eye. It considers that a sign of aggression. All of these feel like enormous departures from previously established tropes, and they all get weird enemies to go with theme. Look at this owl that has the guile haircut. And look at this thing that's clearly inspired by Jason that's just got a knife sticking out of him. Although, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mini Mario still looks gross to me. Little nose, tiny little teeth, they wear platform shoes on their nasty little feet. This whole game feels like a weird dream Mario's having or something, but the thing is, it actually slaps. This is fantastic, especially for a Game Boy game. And you can go left, so it's immediately a hundred times better than its predecessor. And it's got some insanely good music for a Game Boy game. Well, listen to this legendary bop from the space levels. All in all, it's an odd one, but honestly, maybe one of my new favorites. Also, there's a straight up mimic block. Tell me that's not weird. This is another one that may take the cake for Strangest Mario game. This is one of the rare Mario games that's not made by Nintendo, but rather another company is licensing the characters to create an educational game. No, I have to learn something. The premise of this game is that, well, Mario goes missing and Luigi and Yoshi have to go find him. And the search is global. The way it works is Luigi walks through a gate in the castle and then gets teleported somewhere on earth and has to ask bystanders and gather clues to figure out where he is. There's some random NPCs wandering around, and if you manage to catch them, they'll tell you some cryptic bullshit, and you have to gather hints from these conversations to figure out where you are. Then, you gotta smush some Koopa Troopers because they've stolen significant artifacts from the various locations. Then, you find these information booths, and somehow it's always Peach working there no matter where you are in the world, and she's got a bit of an attitude. She won't just let me return priceless artifacts, but makes me take a freaking history quiz. Clearing the quiz lets Luigi go into whatever historical attraction it was and snap a pic. And these are pretty funny. One of them is of Adam's creation from the Sistine Chapel, and Nintendo actually edited out the uh, sensitive regions. I'm double censoring here because I don't know what YouTube's policy on fine art is, but I assure you, there's nothing to censor underneath there. After all of this, for an additional layer of difficulty, you have to open a world map and navigate Yoshi to where Luigi is. Only after you do all of this will you be able to use Yoshi to get back to the castle, successfully having taken the occupied city back from the forces of Bowser. 
You'll work your way through the world learning the history of places you go and learning how to read maps, both local and global. Also, Luigi will only cross streets at crosswalks and looks both ways first. I don't hate this game, I guess, but man, if I was a kid hoping for a fun platforming Mario game, this would sting. For an edutainment game, I would say it's on the better side of things. It's definitely not low effort. But conceptually, this is one of the most bizarre games Mario or Luigi has ever started. Also, is that Double D from Ed, Ed and Eddie? Excuse me! Here it is, the other Super Nintendo game to use the mouse. So in this one, Wario, holy, that's the most brutal mogging in the history of mogging. If we assume Mario's roughly five foot one, then Wario stands at an insane seven foot two. I can't even be present for this, I have to leave. So this is actually a neat little game. Wario does a flyby and covers the head of one of the three playable characters, Peach, Mario, or Yoshi. Because they can't see, they just start walking mindlessly. Peach slowly, Mario at a medium speed, and Yoshi at a brisk jog. In this game, you don't actually control the characters, but rather this magical fairy that can manipulate the environment to provide safe passage for whoever's in trouble. The difficulty ramps up pretty quickly, and there's a lot of levels per stage with each culminating in a boss battle. I actually like the premise of this one, and it's a good usage of the peripheral. another educational game. Yep, made by the same publisher as Mario is Missing, the goal is once again to teach young children about history. Also, to further complicate things, there's apparently a bunch of different versions of this game, but I played the Super Nintendo one, so that's what we're talking about here. The plot of this one is that Bowser has a time emulator, and he's stolen a bunch of extremely valuable artifacts from all over time, and is going to change history forever. Knowing that whatever future Bowser creates will be terrible, Mario must return these precious artifacts to their owners with a time machine. The basic gameplay loop is strange. You grab an artifact and every item will have a little homework sheet attached to it, and you need to fill it out before returning the object. But it'll also have a clue on how to dial in your time machine's dates and coordinates. Once you dial it in, you ride on time waves or something. You have to fill up your mushroom meter and then dive into a whirlpool. If you dive in too early, you get returned to the castle, and if you hit these things, your mushroom meter depletes entirely. Once you've landed, you walk around and talk to people to learn the facts and fill in your homework sheet. Or, if you're a giga brain like me, and you already know everything this children's game could teach you, you fill it in and walk straight up to Isaac Newton? Yep, during my playtime, Mario comes face to face with Newton, Da Vinci, Joan of Arc, Beethoven, and Thomas Jefferson. And then the game just kept going, and I got sick of learning things, so I tapped out. Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3. Is this that weird? Nah. Is this barely technically a Mario game? Yeah. Check it out though. Another Game Boy title, and this is confusingly titled Wario Land Super Mario Land 3. So this is the first game where you play as Mario's antagonist Wario, and he's a bit different in terms of controls. He's less quick and less jumpy, more brute force and strength oriented. The world may actually be the zaniest yet, and Wario's power-ups are very goofy. In fact, from this point on, if Nintendo wants to make a game that's a little zanier or off the wall, they tend to hand it off to Wario, who will become a mainstay in the Nintendo lineup. Not the weirdest, but worth a mention overall, since it does introduce the weird Mario character as the protagonist. And believe it or not, when they move forward with Wario games, despite the title of this one, the next one is just Wario Land 2. Alright, well, we finally made it. Let's boot it up. <laughs> nice of the princess to invite us over for a picnic, eh, Luigi? I hope she made lots of spaghetti. Luigi, look! It's from Bowser. Dear pesky plumbers, the Koopalings and I have taken over the Mushroom Kingdom. The princess is now a permanent guest at one of my seven Koopa hotels. I dare you to find her if you can. We gotta find the princess. And you gotta help us. If you need instructions on how to get through the hotels, check out the enclosed instruction book. Well, sh I don't have it. This is, in my opinion, the biggest question mark on Mario's resume. What on earth was Nintendo thinking licensing this one out? 
is not even on a Nintendo system. It's for the infamous and short-lived Philips CDI, which for some reason doesn't look like a gaming console to me at all, but more like a VCR or something. As you can see, it's sort of like a puzzle platformer. <laughs> After some trial and error, I figured out to beat the stages, you have to close all the doors. As you progress, there's more enemies that will reopen doors and it gets harder in general, but the concept to me just isn't that solid. I don't think you can stretch this out much more than 30 minutes, which is just about when the game would reliably crash for me. And since I barely got this junk working in the first place, I'm taking that as a sign it's time to retire. Again, I think it's safe to say this is just about the high point of Nintendo getting wild and loose with the Mario gaming IP. When you say Weird Mario, if people know about this, this is probably what they're thinking about. Also worth noting, this could probably be the most mean-spirited Mario has ever been, seemingly just stomping on enemies when they're vacationing peacefully without the slightest provocation. I mean, I can't be the only one who feels bad when you stomp on Goombas. Are they even really a threat? You can just walk by. Okay, so quick little pit stop here to talk about some other significant games. Nintendo did actually try some major deviations from the formula that turned into long-running series that people eventually relied upon as part of the normal Nintendo lineup. But I think it's worth talking about the first installment of each of them, as they represent a departure from the norm. We've got Super Mario RPG, which received a remake just last year. This game was Mario's foray into the world of RPGs because, you know, why not? RPGs were popular during this time, and I imagine Nintendo was basically like, well, we can do that too. Slap some Mario in there and call it a day. But again, they went so much harder than they had to and made a fantastic game that everyone remembers fondly to this day. Paper Mario was another oddball, as it's sort of hard to classify this in terms of genre. Is it a platformer, puzzle, RPG action adventure game, all with the visuals of arts and crafts? This is a really neat game, and was clearly beloved enough to justify a pretty long franchise. Then we have Superstar Saga for Game Boy Advance, which took notes from all previous RPG games and made a very clever, very tight little action RPG with a great sense of humor for the handheld fans. However, now that we've talked about these, I can't help but draw a distinction between these and some of the previous entries in this video. These games feel calculated. They have a unique sense of humor. They seem sort of self-aware in a way that the other games weren't. Nintendo seemed to have a plan with this, which is why to me, these are what I call quirky, or if you prefer, safe weird. I no longer see these games as Nintendo being reckless and trying something, anything, until it works. But rather, I see these as a deliberate, intentional departure from the formula. I could fill up another whole video with weird moments from just these games, and maybe I will in the future, but like I said, they just feel like a different kind of weird. But again, who knows, I'm not exactly a Nintendo insider. Maybe these games just worked well and others didn't. Wait, what's this doing on the list? Yeah, between you and me, I don't think this belongs here either. Super Mario 64 is Nintendo's triumphant transition from 2D platforming to 3D, proving not only can it be done, it can be done with excellence. This game is unbelievably fantastic and succeeds in paving the way for all future 3D Mario games, establishing the norm. But this game has had some new life breathed into it by Generation Z. When they go back and play this game without the childhood nostalgia, they see a barren 3D world with little detail. Mario feels isolated and alone in gigantic environments. This game has been called Liminal Horror. It's been said that some stages have a negative emotional aura. There's also a lot of mystery from leaked materials from the game's many betas, leading to the invention of semi-plausible creepy stories about rare events that may or may not occur in specific versions that were lost to time. I've personally played countless horror ROM hacks for this game that seek to amplify the strange elements of the game even further. Is this game weird? I don't know. You tell me. Maybe your copy was just personalized to be particularly scary, then mine wasn't. Well, we've reached a point where the weird games slow down significantly. When I first made this, I thought they stopped completely, but I was wrong. They still make a few oddities from time to time. But what caused the slowdown? Enter the 1993 Mario Brothers movie. Everything about this was completely insane from start to finish. I could talk about this for at least an hour by itself, but I don't have time in this particular video. Essentially, the damage this movie did was enough to give Nintendo a chilling realization. Mario is not invincible. No brand is invincible. A couple more mistakes like the movie might be enough to kill off the Mario property entirely. And if no one is lining up for Mario games, what does Nintendo have to offer? If you offer one thing and one thing alone, you better make sure that thing is in its best condition, huh? 
This lesson was taken to heart, and it's interesting that they were able to learn this in the mid-90s, but modern day brands can't seem to learn the same lesson despite flop after flop. You know what I'm talking about. Brand damage is real, and the reputation Mario has now is pretty much the gold standard in video games. Nintendo sells entire consoles on the strength of the Mario name alone, because honestly, there's no real reason to buy Nintendo consoles outside of that name. Anyway, now that this movie is 30 years old, it's reached optimal nostalgia window, so people have started trying to convince the general public that this is a good movie. Why don't you watch it for yourself? It's not without its merits, but uh, it's definitely a contender for the weirdest Mario property, period. And this is just a little preview of the other weird Mario videos I'll have to make someday. Believe it or not, there's an entire other world out there of strange licensed Mario stuff. Animations, products, educational textbooks, you name it. But to discuss all that would take hours. For now, we're wrapping this one up. There is more weird Mario, but I'll save it for another time. Also, for this video, obviously I played a ton of games that didn't make the list, and now I want to hear from you. What did I miss? What do you think is the strangest Mario game? What do you think is the weirdest thing the plumbers have ever done? Leave your weird Mario moment in the comments. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, subscribe, all the normal stuff. But if you really want to help the channel, the best thing you can do is just watch more. In fact, if you've got time, watch this video right here. It does wonders for the algorithm. Alright, do profit out. See you in the next video.